Well, we're going to carry on now with uh, the next part of looking at the uh, article by Stephen Drizzen and Richard Leo, looking at uh, false confessions in the uh, post-DNA era. Um, congratulations to those who have uh, followed it so far. Um, it, is, it is sometimes a bit heavy going at times, uh, but I think it's worthwhile um, to to look at these um, these articles because I say it's it's what was quoted by William Duffin. There's no doubt that William Duffin, Duffin therefore will have read all of this article and it will have you know, obviously um, the fact that he cites this article is, um, is 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 something that means that this article is well worth reading. Um, as Tracy explained to us yesterday, this article has been cited numerous times, hundreds of times, because of Steve Dresden and Richard Leo's uh, reputation as being experts in the um, psychology of wrongful confessions. Um, so carrying on, we're at page 22, second paragraph. The most thorough analysis of rational choice decision theory, as it applies to the phenomenon of interrogation and confession, can be found in two lengthy articles that I will probably read at some point. Not sure if we'll do a video about it. By social psychologists Richard Offshee and Richard Leo. Uh, you might remember yesterday Travis Williamson was alerting us to the name of Offshe. Building not only on the theoretical research in rational choice and game theory, but also on earlier applied research by Hilgendorf, Irving and others, Offshe and Leo write, psychological interrogation is effective at eliciting confessions because of the fundamental fact of human decision making. People make optimising choices, giving the alternatives they consider. Psychologically based interrogation works effectively by controlling the alternatives a person considers and by influence, influencing how those alternatives are understood. The techniques interrogators use have been selected to limit a person's attention to certain issues, to manipulate his perceptions of his present situation, and to bias his evaluation of the choices before him. The techniques used to accomplish these manipulations are so effective that if misused, they can result in decisions to confess from the guilty and innocent alike. Police elicit the decision to confess from the guilty by leading them to believe that the evidence against them is overwhelming and their fate is certain whether or not they confess and that they and that there are advantages that follow if they confess. Investigators elicit the decision to confess from the innocent in one of two ways either by leading them to believe that their situation, though unjust, is hopeless and will only be improved by confessing, or by persuading them that they probably committed a crime about which they have no memory and that confessing is the proper and optimal course of action. Offshe and Leo argue that modern police interrogation is a two-step process of psychological manipulation. The first step of interrogation is designed to reduce a suspect's subjective self-confidence that he will survive the interrogation without being arrested by persuading him that he has been caught because the evidence incontrovertibly established his guilt, that no reasonable person could come to any other conclusion, and thus that there is no way out of his predicament. Once the investigator has convinced the suspect that he is powerless to change his situation because his denials will not be accepted and he cannot change the overwhelming incriminating evidence that the police claim to possess. The investigator offers the suspect inducements, i.e. reasons to confess. 
that are designed to persuade him that he is psychologically, materially and or legally better off by cooperating with police and confessing than he is by continuing to deny any role in the crime. And I think that's that's so true. We have seen that in so many wrongful convictions, not just of youths, but sometimes of, of ordinary adult people who have been presented with this idea that there is no way out for them. And a little bit like Michael O'Kelly's um, questionnaire, first question, I'm sorry for what I did or I'm not. There is, there is no option of a box to tick. I had nothing to do with this. Ofshi and Leo point out that in the first step of interrogation, shifting a suspect from confident to hopeless, the investigator usually relies on several well-known interrogation techniques and strategies to persuade the suspect that he is caught and that he is powerless to change the situation. The investigator is likely to accuse the suspect of having committed the crime cut off the suspect's denials, roll past the suspect's objections and interrupt or ignore the suspect's assertions of innocence. If the suspect offers an alibi, the interrogator will attack it as inconsistent, contradicted by all of the case evidence, implausible and or simply impossible, even if none of those assertions is true. The most effective technique used to persuade a suspect that his situation is hopeless is to confront him with seemingly objective and incontrovertible evidence of his guilt, whether or not any actually exists. American police often confront suspects with fabricated evidence, such as non-existent eyewitnesses, false fingerprints, next page make believe videotapes fake polygraph results and so on if police already possess evidence of the suspect's guilt they are likely to exaggerate the type amount and or strength of such evidence the purpose of this technique is to convince the suspect that the state's case against him is so compelling and immutable that his guilt can be established beyond any reasonable date and that arrest, prosecution and conviction are therefore inevitable. These techniques, accusation, cutting off denials, attacking alibis and confronting the suspect with real or non-existent, evis non-existent evidence are often repeated as the pressures of interrogation escalate over and over again. The investigator conveys the message that the suspect has no meaningful choice but to admit to some version of the crime because continued resistance in light of the ex extensive and irrefutable evidence against him is simply futile. These techniques are thus designed to persuade the suspect to perceive his situation and thus his options much differently than when he first entered the interrogation room. Of she and Leo point out that in the second step of interrogation, eliciting the admission, the investigator seeks to persuade the suspect that the benefits of compliance and confession outweigh the costs of resistance and denial, and thus that the only way to improve his otherwise helpless situation is by admitting to some version of the offence. In this phase of the interrogation process, the investigator presents the suspect with inducements that communicate that he will receive some personal, moral, communal, procedural, material, legal and or other benefit if he confesses, but that he will experience some corresponding personal, moral, communal procedural, material, legal and or other cost if he fails to confess. Offshi and Leo argue that the interrogator's inducements can be arrayed, arrayed along a continuum ranging from appeals to morality at the low end to appeals to how the criminal justice system is likely to react 
to the suspect's denial versus confession in the mid-range to implicit and or explicit threats and promises at the high end. Low-end inducements refer to self-image, interpersonal or moral appeals that suggest the suspect will feel better or improve his social standing if he confesses. For example, an interrogator may, may suggest that by confessing, the suspect will experience catharsis and thus get it off his chest, or tell the suspect that only the truth will set him free, or state that only by confessing will he earn the forg forg forgiveness of God, the victim or victims, and or the suspect's own family. Systemic inducements refer to appeals that seek to lead the suspect to reason that his case will be processed more favourably by all actors in the criminal justice system if he admits to some version of the offence, but that he will be treated less favourably if he continues to deny involvement. For an example, an interrogator may tell a suspect that he can only be the suspect's ally if the suspect first admits guilt or may ask the suspect how he expects the prosecutor, judge and or jury will react if the suspect does not demonstrate remorse and admit to the offence. High-end inducements either implicitly or explicitly communicate the message that the suspect will receive less punishment, a lower prison sentence, or some form of investigative, prosecutorial, judicial, or jury, juror leniency or clemency if he confesses, but that the suspect will receive a higher charge or longer prison sentence if he does not confess. For example, in homicide cases, Interrogators often suggest that if the suspect admits to the crime, it will be framed as an unintentional accident or as an act of justifiable self-defence, but that, it, that if he continues to deny guilt, his actions will be portrayed in their worst possible light as premeditated, cold-blooded murder. This is a familiar variant of the maximisation minimization technique first described by Saul Kassan. This technique is intended to communicate through pragmatic implication that the suspect will receive more lenient treatment if he confesses but harder, harsher punishment if he does not. Of course, off investigators will sometimes also rely on blatant threats of harsh, harsher punishment, such as death penalty threats, and explicit promises of leniency, such as offers of outright release from custody to extract a confession. Modern psychological interrogation is a gradual yet cumulative process. Each technique builds on the state on the ne builds on the next as the investigator seeks to emphasise the overriding strength of the state's case and the futility of the suspect's denial. Intended for the guilty, modern interrogation techniques are psychologically powerful enough to elicit confessions from the innocent. Investigators successfully elicit true confessions by persuading the guilty that the evidence against them is so compelling that they have no meaningful choice but to cooperate with the authorities and hope for favourable treatment. Using the same interrogation methods, methods investigators sometimes elicit confessions from the innocent who do not know that police are legally permitted to fabricate evidence and lie during interrogation, either by one, persuading them that their situation is hopeless, since they are told no reasonable person will believe their assertions of innocence in light of the evidence, and that the only way to save themselves from the worst possible case outcome or punishment is by admitting to the minimised 
or less exculpatory version of the offence that the detective is suggesting, or two, persuading the innocent suspect that the evidence is so overwhelming that he must have committed the crime in the absence of any memory of having done so, and there is a legitimate explanation for his amnesia, a less common type of interrogation-induced false confession that will be discussed in more depth below. Though it may be unintentional, police interrogators usually elicit false confessions through the use of coercive inducements that either implicitly or explicitly threaten harm and or promise leniency. The innocent suspect typically confesses only after the techniques and strategies of the interrogator have persuaded him that, in light of what he perceives to be his limited options and the consequences of choosing denial over silence, confession is the most rational cause of action. I think once again we'll leave it there and uh, we'll do the next part um, from maybe tomorrow at some point. Anyway, thanks for tuning in again. Uh, stick with it. Um, there, there is some heavy going stuff at, at, at times, but there are some absolute gems that, um, as I say, for this article to be cited so many times uh, by other lawyers means that this, <laughs> I like the way how Tracy referred to uh, Saul Kassan as, um, or was it, no, what was it? The, the, there was there was one item and it was the the gold standard. This is maybe I'm getting my little bits confused there, but apologies for that. Um, she did use the word the gold standard. I, th I think I think it refers to you know if if a confession is genuine, then yeah courts do deem that as being the gold standard when it comes to evidence. So yes, I would I would construe it that being that this article by Drizzing and Leo is one of the gold standards of, of um, explanation of the reason why we end up with so many false confessions. Anyway, we'll catch you again later. Bye for now.